Welcome everyone to the 2023 Modern Investor Summit, now in its third consecutive year as the largest event in the world for retail investors. I'm Max Rafaga, CEO and founder of Finimize, and over the next two days, we'll navigate the ever-evolving investment landscape with 13 virtual sessions, finishing off at our in-person event in central London. In a world of unprecedented change, where retail investors are on the rise, our generation faces historic economic complexities. And at the Modern Investor Summer, our goal is to equip the retail investor with the best ideas from the smartest minds. Empowering you with opinions on market forecasts for 2024, opportunities and emerging trends, what's next for inflation and interest rates, as well as unveiling cutting edge investment strategies that you can put to use. Now, before we kick it off, I'd like to say a huge thank you and shout out to our wonderful lead virtual sponsor, the CFA Institute, our insights partner, iShares, HealthWords, and all our session speaking partners. Without our sponsors, none of this would be possible. So now on to the first speaker of the day. It is an absolute honor to introduce our first guest, Ray Dalio. As the founder of Bridgewater Associates, one of the world's largest hedge funds, Dalio has shaped the landscape of global finance. His groundbreaking principles on economics and investing, as outlined in his best-selling book, Principles, have garnered widespread acclaim. With a career marked by innovation and success, Ray Dalio continues to be a sought-after voice in the realms of finance, economics, and geopolitics. As we embark on the summit, let Ray Dalio's experience empower us all. Now, if you haven't already, please introduce yourself in the chat box with your name and where you're tuning in from. Also, thanks to everyone who submitted their questions beforehand. I've drafted the questions that I'm going to pose to Ray in a second to cover as many of them as possible. So welcome to the Finimize Investor Summit. Let's kick it off. Ray, great to have you, and thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. Great to be with you and also uh, to speak to uh, your audience, which is an audience that at this stage of my life, I really love to be able to speak with and also pass along whatever I know. Fantastic. We really appreciate you taking the time. Um, I'd love to start with a really high level. Uh, you're a global macro investor for 50 years. Uh, and there's probably nobody better placed than you to assess and interpret what is happening in the world right now, both geopolitically and economically. And we'd really love to start by setting the scene, uh, getting your take on the current situation. And I also know that you're a, a big student of history. Uh, so does this remind you of a specific historic time from which we could perhaps draw lessons for, for today? Yes, yes, yes. Um... That's right. You know, one of the things that I learned in my life over those 50 years is that many of the things that surprised me surprised me because they didn't happen in my lifetime. So I didn't experience them, but they happened many times in history. So when important things are happening that didn't happen in my lifetime, I go back in history. So I there were three big things that drew my attention to studying history and then made me study the last 500 years of history because I wanted to see the rises and declines of reserve currencies, empires, and so on. And those three things were, first, the amount of debt creation and money printing that we're on is the highest since the 1930 to 45 period. And I bought, watched patterns of that. So what does that mean for the value of money and what does that mean for reserve currencies and so on? The second is uh, the great internal conflict, populism of the left and the right. In other words, the extremities coming from uh, large wealth gaps, the largest wealth gap since 1900, and a lot of values gaps. So the left and the right. And that also is the largest since the 1930 to 45 period. And then number three is the rising of a great power to challenge the existing great power and the existing world order. In other words, China, the world geopolitical struggle. You know, it used to be that the United States would set the rules pretty unilaterally because at the end of World War II, 
We had 80% of the world's money, which was gold at the time. We had uh, the monopoly on military power. And we had accounted for half the world's GDP. And that changed a lot. So those three things, the amount of debt and money creation, the amount of internal conflict of extremism, uh, populism of the left or the right, and the um, uh, geopolitical conflict. And then when I studied history, I saw that um, acts of nature, droughts, floods, and pandemics were an enormous influence through history. Uh, more uh, Droughts, floods, and pandemics killed more people than wars. And so it was a big influence. And then, of course, over time, invention, inventions and changes in technology. So those five factors, particularly how they interact, drove markets, drove policies that drove markets. And then, of course, the markets drove those policies. And to answer your question of when, the most recent time was the 1930 to 45 period, but it happened many times before. And, it, and you think mechanistically, I'd like to convey to people, it's not just a, 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 that there were coincidence in history, there were cause effect relationships that are important, such as the value and printing of money and the amount of debt. And just to un un unpack a couple of those points, um, may maybe to start off with the point around debt uh, that you mentioned, um, it's been over the news, uh, the, the the levels of debt specifically uh, in the U.S. Um, would love to understand how you think about the, the future role of the U.S., given the debt issue, given the division in the world among the superpowers, given the rise of the BRICS and how they are trying to challenge also the, the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency. Um, how you think about the role of the U.S., if you think there is a successor in the making, if we look to China, if we look to India, is it one of the two? Is it someone that we are not aware of? Is it perhaps the collective of the BRICS? How, how do you think about that? Um, and, and do you think there is a genuine scenario where the U.S. reserve currency might get challenged? Um, thank you for that, Gret, and multifaceted question. So yeah. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll, um, I'll, I'll cover them all, I hope. Um, the first thing I want to do is, also, is explain the mechanics. And it's really common sense mechanics regarding, regarding debt. As debt rises faster than income, debt service payments rise faster than income. And as a result, they require more money to service that debt, which for you and for individuals and for companies and for countries, that's all the same, except I'll get for monetary policy in a second. But in other words, it squeezes out consumption as you pay back the debt and you have to pay uh, debt service payments on it. The only difference between the government is that the government has a central bank that can print money. And so when you get a lot of debt rising relative to incomes, then the central bank um, who wants to keep that going then is inclined to print money, which devalues money. There's also another dimension of this. That's the supply and the demand of debt. So, for example, when we, the government runs a large deficit, that means it has to sell debt to finance that deficit. In other words, they sell bonds. And when everybody has a lot of bonds, like they do now, because one man's debts are another man's financial assets, they're holding them in the form of bonds, and the government then... Uh, prints a lot of money and produces inflation, those produce poor returns. And also, then when they already have a lot of debt and they're losing money on the debt as they are now, when they sell that debt, they don't. the buyers don't want to buy as much of that debt. And that can create a supply-demand balance on top of the debt service problem that I described. So when you're looking at the situation as we are now, it does not go on forever, uh, just mechanistically, it uh, corrects. And so we are at that part of the cycle where there becomes an acceleration in debt because more and more debt 
is used to pay more, more and more debt service. And you can get that selling. So that's where we are in the part of the cycle. That is a world problem. It's not just a US problem. And in history, we see that that's a problem for Europe and the Euro. That's a problem for Japan and the yen. And to some extent, to a significant extent, it's a problem of China and so on. But that's been true in history. In other words, in the 70s, for example, or in the 1930s and many times in history, you see that um, it's not so much that you have a movement from one currency to another, though you can. With recent downgrades of U.S. debt, there's more concern about that. But, uh, but it really has more of an effect of what is the value of the bonds and the debt and what does it mean for inflation? And so they all go down. There's a risk of them all going down. So I and, and what that means is when m the value of debt and money goes down, you see higher levels of inflation. You see uh, those types of concerns. So we're now in a situation where I think the most important thing to look at is the real interest rate. In other words, the interest rate relative to inflation. And so you follow that. That, uh, when they were giving away money for free, when most interest rates were negative in the world, and when um, you, had, you had a negative real interest rate, compensation for holding debt was negative uh, after inflation, that by about 1.7%, that's gone up to nearly 2.5%. And so I think that it's going to have to stay up there. Two things to look out for, okay, that'll signal if there's the change. Those two things are first, a decline in real interest rates that would be significant, and second, related to that, a um, the Federal Reserve coming in and doing quantitative easing again. In other words, printing money and buying debt. If you see those two things happen, then you should expect a lot of selling of bonds and, uh, and as a result, also uh, a pickup in the inflation rate. So it's the question is really going to be in this time ahead, what is the best storehold of wealth? As we look around, uh, you know, the world to think about the storehold of wealth. And it lots depends on how the um, geopolitical and political system works and how uh, in this wealth fight, there is, uh, you know, a grabbing of that money or how, uh, at, because there's not enough money to grow around. By the way, there's not enough money to grow around just for the things I've mentioned. But even if you include things like climate, the estimated cost of uh, climate, dealing, dealing with climate change or not dealing with climate change, is estimated between five and $10 trillion a world, ten, five and $10 trillion a year worldwide. The world GDP is $100 trillion. So that's 5 to 10% of GDP. There's not enough money to go around. And the issue of printing that money to deal with it is something we have to pay the attention to in thinking about the value of money. And so what do you think will happen in the in the US with the debt problem? Is there going to be a turning point where there is going to have to be a reset? Or do you have confidence that the politicians are going to figure out a way to get out of the situation? Or where do we go from here? I think that um, you're going to you're going to encounter we are going to encounter um, a debt squeeze. And the question is, how long it's going to be before um, there is the selling of bonds by the owner. So let's let's say- And, and, and uh, just, just for those who don't, when you say debt squeeze, what, if you could just explain what you mean by that. Well, that debt service payments by the government is going to um, increase. And there'll be a need to deal with that while at the same time, the government is selling a lot more debt. And what that means is that we're going to see um, squeezes in the budget deficits. So they're going to either deal with issues like entitlements, very big political issue, you know, entitlements, 
um, and, or they're going to encounter that kind of debt squeeze in the best case possible. Debt squeeze means, um, okay, they lose, they can't increase the budget and they have to decrease the budget. And when we're dealing with the geopolitical world that we're in, um, that means you can't increase the defense budget. You can't increase other um, forms of spending, climate and so on. So the squeeze means you either cut that down or you have to print a lot of mo money. The question, this, as I say, the second part of that question, that's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is that they actually uh, sell too much debt relative to the world's desire to buy that debt, which is a real risk because a lot of the holders of that debt have lost money in that debt. And they're also in other countries. And those in other countries are increasingly concerned. They're concerned about sanctions. So a number of these countries uh, could be sanctioned. Sanction means that their debt holdings are um, not, are frozen in much the way that Russia's were frozen. You could see that concern in China. You can see it in other countries. So there's not only a fact that they are owning a lot of bonds that have cost them a lot of money, and then they have to buy a lot more at a fast pace, but there's also those geopolitical concerns. And then there's concerns in other countries, like there are concerns at home, about how things are going in the United States, how we are with each other, how we're managing the situation. The political aspect is important. If those things lead to then the selling or not buying enough bonds, then what that means is that interest rates go up. In other words, there's not enough demand relative to the supply and rates rise because it, cur it curtails, that rate rise curtails private borrowing. And that would mean an economic weakening would take place because the interest rates rise. That would put the Fed in a very difficult position because the Fed would then have to choose about buying those bonds, printing money. And where do they get it from? They print money and they buy the bonds, printing money and buying the bonds to hold those rates down, which is why I mentioned the two things. That, that's called quantitative easing. And so if we see quantitative easing and you see uh, that kind of behavior, uh, then a big red flag should rise and one should realize that there's a real risk of the of the big leg down in the value of money and uh, debt, mm -hmm. and, and and zooming out again a little bit uh, to to the role of the U.S. Um, where do, I, I've seen a lot of your fantastic content that you put out there, and you talked a lot about um, how during these cycles superpowers rise and they fall. If you had to give an assessment of, of, of where the U.S. stands today, do you think they're still on the rise? Do you think they're starting to go into the turning point of the fall? Or, or, or how, how would you look at that? Uh, in, in my book called The Changing World Order, or better yet, if your audience uh, is inclined to, I would recommend that you watch a YouTube video that it's a free video that I put out. It's an animated video. People enjoy it. It's called the changing world order. It's a YouTube video and it covers the whole thing because in that it objectively shows a number of measures of the strength of the United States relative to the strength of other countries. Many, many measures. So, um, for example, uh, education levels, uh, share of world trade, share of world GDP, military power, many others. And, and they're measured through that whole period of time. And it shows the patterns, it shows the cycles in the past. Uh, the United States is in a relative decline, uh, a fairly uh, significant relative to decline, partially because those things in many ways are deteriorating, that we have a debt issue that we talked about, we have internal conflicts, those things. But also on a relative basis, other countries have risen in their powers. For example, I started to go to China in 1984. They didn't have any money then, and uh, they invited me over <clears throat> to teach them about the world financial markets, um, and I had the interesting experience of going there and, and then going there many times since. And since then, since 1985, four, uh, per capita income in China 
has increased by 28 times. So other countries um, have become um, grown a lot and they have become more competitive. So the relative competitiveness of the United States using many measures, education levels, health, uh, longevity. You know, the average American lives five years less than the average uh, country that has about uh, similar income. In other words, an average American lives five years less than a Canadian or five years less than uh, a Brit and the, the Germans and, and, and others uh, comparably, even though we spend more money on health care, because we have a number of issues. We have um, uh, more, more crimes, more mental illness, more um, um, drug problems, more of those types of things. And so they all represent, all of these indicators represent a uh, an objective observer of those, of the measures of those health, would show a relative decline. And so, so if you're a retail investor today, you mentioned obviously uh, the real interest rate and how that will develop. That's one of the things that you would look out for. Are there any other things that you would keep an eye out for um, and looking specifically into the next year? Um, how, how, if you're a retail investor today, how would you think about that and how would you position yourself? Well, I think the first thing I want to say to most retail investors is you have to think about whether you can um, you can beat the markets. Um, a lot of people think I can go play that game and I can beat the markets. I would say uh, winning in the markets is more difficult than winning in the Olympics. And there are more money after it, more trying, and it's pretty much a zero-sum game. And also, I would say any advice I give with you now, um, I wouldn't want people that, I'm, you know, who things may change. And in a month from now, I might have a different view. And I, so I would like to say that the most important things of investing are a few qualities. So I would say, if I explain that, let's say, uh, at depth, I would say, first of all, um, in, invest your, in, in what you need most. Um, you know, invest in um, your house or your apartment is your environment. And that environment is a very important thing. Invest in your education. Invest in those things. And then once you get past those things that create your environment, invest in yourself if you're an entrepreneur. For example, you're an entrepreneur and look at what you've accomplished. But also then as you go beyond that, uh, think about how much money you need to invest. I I didn't have any money, and I, I just got hooked on this great game of investing. And I uh, would count how many months could I maintain my uh, spending if I didn't have an income. And I try to build up those amount of months, and I'd be very conservative. And I suppo said, supposing I lost half of that amount, to inflation or bad decision making or something. Uh, so I'd want to have twice the amount. So I'd really encourage uh, that notion of, uh, of saving, investing in yourself and then saving. And then in the way to do that, I want to encourage people to diversify well. Uh, I'll give some thoughts about how to do that. But diversifying is, the, is essentially the free lunch. Think of it this way. If you pick three equally good investments and they're not correlated, you're going to have the average return of those three investments and you're going to reduce the risk. And if you can get uncorrelated investments, I, I call it the holy grail investment. If you can get 10 to 15 good uncorrelated investments, you'll reduce your risk by 70 to 80 percent of your uh 70 to 80 percent without reducing your return so knowing how to diversify well is another message and and we won't be able to cover it here but um uh, you can see it on youtube or you can um, go to my book uh, and see it but and anyway headline diversify well the next thing i would say is um be careful about debt um be careful about owning too much debt assets 
and also having too much debt liabilities. Uh, I explained to you why I'm concerned about the value of money. And so I would be concerned about that. And I would also say that when thinking about where to diversify, um, think about um, j beyond uh, just the United States. You know, uh, the, we have a situation where um, a relatively few number of stocks have done uh, very, very well. And by the way, they, they've become expensive. And the market as a whole has not done very well. And stock yields and expected returns are not particularly high against re interest rates right now. So uh, to be able to diversify well um, in considering outside the country, remember that the uh, best investments um, are not necessarily the best companies. The worst companies can be better investments than the best companies because uh, it's in the price. You know, it's like a horse in a horse race. Um, if uh, betting on the best horse is not going to get you an edge relative to betting on the worst horse because the market discounts that. So you have to be aware of all those things. And I would say we are now in an environment in which the fundamentals of what makes a good economy are most important. And I'll say that there are three things that I would highlight as to, you know, like which places, countries uh, are important. It's like which com companies are important. I would say first, does the country have a good income statement and balance sheet? Does it spend more than it earns? And does it have more assets than liabilities? Is it financially strong? Because in these challenging times, that's important. The second thing is, does it have um, internal conflict that can be debilitating? Or do you have good, healthy competition in capital markets that allow the efficiencies of production. And the number three is, is the com company country at risk of a big war or not? Those are the things that I think are important if you're going to diversify. I suspect that most of your investors have probably a disproportionate amount of uh, investment um, being long in the stock market. The, you know, always being on one side of the market and always being in one market um, is a risky thing. I would also say that I would um, have uh, a bit of gold. Um, a bit of gold uh, is something that is a very effective diversifier. So actually adding gold to the portfolio raises its expected return uh, without uh, depending on the particular assets held in the portfolio, but it, it diversifies. And so it's almost a bit of an insurance policy. Mm -hmm. So those would be my general okay. uh, quick off the top of the head recommendations. Fantastic. Thank you. And you and you mentioned just before we move to the to the quick fire round, you mentioned how you got into the world of investing and, and you're obviously famous for your global macro strategy approach to investing. W was curious uh, how you got into it. Um, what land what made you land on that approach? Um, uh, if, you, if you could share that story. OK. I was 12 and I did various kinds of jobs. I would at a newspaper route. I uh, uh, shovel driveways for snow and I caddied. And when I was caddying, I bought my, the stock market was hot at the time and everybody was talking about it. And uh, the people I would caddy for would talk with me about it. And I would take my caddying money. I got $6 a bag. I carried two bags. I got $12 around. And then I took that $12. And whenever I got $50, I would then put it into the market. And I, I was introduced, everybody had a stockbroker. I was introduced by my dad to a stockbroker and, and he did it. And the first stock I bought was the only stock I ever heard of that was selling for less than $5 a share. And I thought, well, if I bought more shares and it went up, I could make more money. And that was obviously a dumb strategy. I didn't know it at the time, but the company uh, was about to go broke and some other company came along and acquired it. It was an airlines, Northeast airlines, and it tripled in value. And I said, I, I like this game. I look at the wall street journal, New York times and all those listings. Hey, I could find those. And so I got hooked on the markets that way. And it was really that game 
that uh, really got me hooked on the markets. And if I can make money doing it, that's how I got hooked. And then specifically in the, in the in the macro strategy, was that something that you developed over time as you understood this quote unquote game a bit better? Or was that from the start your your niche that you said, this is the area that I really want? No, no, no. Uh, at first, the, 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 the investment thinking at the time was dollar cost average. You yeah. just put your money in average it and put this and pick the best stocks okay um and then i encountered 1966 1966 was the real dollar the, in other words the inflation adjusted top in the stock market from 1966 until 1984 the stock market had a negative real return and it went down and so uh particularly 66 causes the 70 recession, which caused um, the government to default on its promise to uh, give gold for the paper money that was out there, the devaluation, and it caused the 70s, which caused asset prices to fall, big bear market, 73, 74, the oil shock, and so on. And that's when I started to realize that macro meant a lot. I needed to understand macro. And it's also how I started to realize that I needed to not just be long all the time, I needed to go learn how to go short. So uh, that was really what drove me to become uh, macro because macro drives everything. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. That's, thanks so much for your insights. Uh, let's move very quickly to the to the quick fire round. Um, what piece of advice do you wish someone would have given you earlier in your investing journey? Um, I think... Uh, the bit of advice which was the biggest learning I had um, was um, to know how to to diversify and to know that whatever success I would have in life was more due, I learned this through my experience, more due to knowing how to deal with what I didn't know than anything I knew. And I would also say study history. So let me tell you the story that changed everything. In 1979-80, I had calculated that American banks had lent more money to emerging countries than those countries were going to be able to pay back at those interest rates, and that there would be a big debt default. And that was a very controversial perspective at the time. And it turned out to be right. In August 1982, Mexico defaulted and a number of other countries defaulted on their debts. And I thought uh, that we were going to have a bear market, uh, the debt crisis and so on. And um, I was test they asked me to testify to Congress about this problem because I had anticipated the, the, the debt defaults. I was on Wall Street week and I couldn't have been more wrong. The bottom in the stock market was uh, when same month as Mexico defaulted in August 1982. And I lost money for me. I lost money for my clients. I was so broke that I had to borrow $4,000 from my dad to help to pay for family bills. And that was an extremely painful experience. And that was one of the best experiences I had in life. It changed my whole approach to decision making on almost everything. Um, because it started to make me think I want to, I want the upside, but I don't want, I can't do it with the downside like that. And so I learned how to, um, reduce my risk without reducing my expected returns by diversifying well. And I learned that what I don't know is greater than what I do know. And, and to have others stress test me in my thinkings. Um, so I find the smartest people who I, uh, can who disagree with me to learn to stress test my thinking and then I learned to systemize my decision making writing down rules testing those rules seeing how they would have worked throughout time and executing that game plan by looking at those rules and since that point in 1982 um, it's been it's been good we've had no major <laughs> losses in, in any of the uh, you know in those many years and we've done very well with the um with the gains and so um 
It taught me humility. That affected most of my life in terms of thinking about that. I'm uh, what I don't. One of the biggest sources of success, as I say, is knowing how to deal with what I don't know, uh, which is greater than what I do know, by through a combination of curiosity and having uh, thoughtful disagreement and having people challenge me, as well as diversification. And building up on that, um, what was your best and what was your worst investment? If you're happy to share. Um, well, since that point, I had very high levels of diversification. And I, uh, the best was, was uh, uh, we, we anticipated the financial crisis in, 19, in 2008 because I studied the exact same thing happened in 2008 as happened in 1933. And that was you had a debt crisis with interest rates hitting zero and the central bank then having to print money and, and so on. So that um, we made a lot of money in uh, 2008, pretty good in 2009. And then 2011, 10 and 11, we, met, we had blockbuster years that were like 40% or more uh, because of that understanding that we got about how history affects uh, markets. Those, those were the, um, you know, those who I would say stand out as um, an opportunity to have very diversified, relatively risk averse portfolio that allowed us for our clients and ourselves to be in a position of doing very well when um, others failed. I think one of the big risks is most people are long and most are leveraged long. The whole world is leveraged long. Companies are leveraged long and so on. So um, to be able to reduce risk and diversify and not just be leverage long uh, is an important approach to the market. So that was one of the good ones. And uh, that was one of the good periods that I would say stands out as being exceptional. And then final question, uh, we, we're experiencing a time of uncertainty, uh, wars, uh, a, a lot of negative news in the headlines. What is the one thing that excites you about the future? Uh, the, the one thing that excites me about the future is the inventiveness, the way, and it relates, of course, to artificial intelligence, but the way that we can use systemized learning for the last, uh, 20, 25 years, um, we have, uh, we at Bridgewater have written down all of these decision rules, tested them back in the game plan and so on. And now uh, with the developments, um, it's a great, um, it's an exciting opportunity because if you look at man's evolution over time, man used to be like oxen, you know, they would plow the fields and we had the agri agricultural period. And then during the industrial revolution, man's cleverness and machines came about. And so the physical was um, dealt with increasingly by machines. Now we're dealing with the intellectual, being able to deal with machines. I think it's very threatening, too. Um, I think it's threatening in a number of ways. Uh, but one of the things is it still hallucinates. And you can't escape um, thinking. It's very important to use um, these tools to supplement one's thinking, like uh, our human brain interacting with the computer operating in its way is a very, very powerful uh, force for the future. So um, I, I think that's uh, very good. It's also very scary uh, because, first of all, this technology can be used for hurting people, wars. You know, it's a war technology that can be we could do a lot of damage to each other. And also um, that productivity that is happening affects those, benefits those who um, are a small percentage of the population initially, who, um, you know, that's one of the challenges we have. A very small percentage of the population is coming up with a lot of these invent inventions and doing really, really great. And those inventions, to some extent, are uh, replacing people in jobs and um, creating um, greater wealth gaps. So um, that's going to require policy, that, and policy is going to require us to be uh, good with each other. And so when I look at the situation, 
my big concern is, um, as I said, uh, these five inf these five forces, and related to that is number one, is how are we going to be with each other? How are we going to be with each other? Can we together uh, work well together um, and be productive? Can we have a good political system and a good economic system? in which we uh, work well together in a competitive environment with ample cap capital for those who come up with good ideas, making that uh, productivity pass to the population as a whole. That'll be critical. If we can do that, we're going to have um, a But history, I'll, get, I'll repeat, go to see the uh, Changing World Order on YouTube. History has shown that this is a very, very difficult period of time. So when I look ahead and I think the elections, um, they're going to big wealth decisions are going to be made as a result of those elections, big geopolitical and internal uh, uh, political decisions are going to be made as a result of those elections. So you have to look, is it being done well? Are we good with each other to be peaceful and productive? Those are the things that I'm focusing on. Ray, thank you so much for your time uh, and thanks for taking so much time with us today um, to share all your thoughts on, on such a wide range of topics. And I also want to, to, to give you a special shout out that I think uh, the very fact that you're putting so much emphasis on sharing your, your wisdoms and your knowledge and your experiences uh, with the wider public is an incredibly noble act and and we i think we i can speak for all of us that it's that we truly appreciate it and i can say for myself i've learned a lot uh from your materials so thank you for putting the time out well in, thank in, you in, and putting it out thank there you. thank you for saying that um i'm at a stage in my life where um th th it's a great joy to pass along what i've learned and i want to thank you for doing what you're doing with your audience uh it's a it's a wonderful Absolute company pleasure. that you've made and um your audience is just the perfect uh, audience for what I'm trying to convey. So thank you for being a partner in that. Thank you so much, Ray. And thanks everybody for, for dialing in. Obviously don't go away. We have some fantastic sessions coming up right after this, but I uh, hope you enjoy today and look forward to seeing you at all the other sessions at the Finimize Modern Investor Summit. Thanks so much, Ray. You've been fantastic.